Um, I am Julie Moody Freeman. Um, I am the director for the Center for Black Diaspora Studies, and you are at Being Black and Queer, Challenging Misconceptions and Making Room. My first thanks this evening goes out to Jessica Williams, who lovingly prepared this program for you. I'm so grateful to her for that. Um, along with Jessica, I would like to welcome affinity members, Irma Stanley, Jessica Switzer, and Anne Raul, along with Michael Riley. So um, first, this program, of course, no program can um, happen without thanks to those who helped. My co-presenters for this are the Department of African and Black Diaspora Studies, the department um, LGBTQIA plus resource center, and of course, the Center for Black Diaspora. Thanks also to the center staff, Joel Daly, the assistant director for the center, Catherine Douglas, the administrative assistant, Jennifer Ogumiki, and of course, Jessica Williams also, who are our student workers with the center. Thanks to everybody um, for your contributions. This evening, I will introduce uh, Michael Riley. Michael Riley will introduce our panelists for the evening. But before Michael does that, I'd like to introduce him. I want to thank him for agreeing to not only co-present this event, but to do the introductions. So Michael Akeem Riley is the LGBTQIA plus resource center coordinator within the Office of Multicultural Student Success at DePaul University. In his role, Michael's main objective is to uplift and create a more inclusive world for those who hold marginalized genders and sexualities on DePaul's campus and beyond. Prior to this role, Michael was the training and development coordinator with the Center for Identity, Inclusion and Social Change at DePaul. Throughout his work, Michael strives to engage a more liberated framework for all. Prior to DePaul, Michael was the assistant director of the LGBT uh, Resource Center and an assistant residence director with the Office of Residential Education at Syracuse University. In the classroom, Michael has taught courses on intergroup dialogue, gender and sexuality, and facilitated countless presentations and workshops on topics ranging from more inclusion language, toxic ma masculinity, and supporting trans students in the classroom. In his spare time, Michael enjoys live music, thrift shopping, shopping, book clubs, and dismantling hegemonic ways of being. Please welcome Michael Riley. Thank you, Michael. Hello, and thank you so much for that. That was a really um, nice reading of my um, bio. Um, like Dr. Moody Freeman said, my name is Michael Akeem Riley, and I use he, him pronouns. Um, and I have the privilege of introducing our folks from Affinity. So I'm going to read a little bit about their bios and um, pass it over to them after we get done. All right, give me one second, y'all. Okay, well, I'm going to start off with um, Irma Stanley. Irma Rianne Stanley uses they them pronouns and is a gender creative non-binary writer, poet, activist, facilitator, and community organizer. Irma serves as a program coordinator at Affinity Community Services and a peer leader for Affinity's masculine of center peer led group spectrum. Their work at Affinity is focused on advocating for the liberation of Black LGBTQ plus communities and creating healing community spaces for Black queer women and all people who have lived, um, who have lived experiences of misogyny. Next, we have Jessica Witzer. Je Jessica Witzer uses she, her pronouns and is the finance manager for Invictus, Invictus Strategy Group and the peer lead for Legacy Affinities 40 and Under Group. She is comfortable wearing many hats, 
for the good of an organization and has five years of varying experience working alongside the CEOs of major political organizations, such as Democracy for America and the Collective PAC. Next, we have Anne Rowell. Anne Rowell uses she, her pronouns and is a black bisexual community facilitator who has been affiliated with Affinity for over 20 years. She is the peer lead for Affinity's longest running peer group 40 plus and is also the 2020 recipient for the Barbara Smith Award of Excellence. And last but not least, we have Jessica Williams. Jessica Williams uses she, her pronouns and is a poet, writer, and activist. Her focal point centers on the intersections of race, gender, and sexuality. Jessica has a passion for Black culture and showcasing positive womanist theories. She is presently working on her MA in Women's and Gender Studies at DePaul University. Let's give it up for the Affinity staff, and I'm going to pass it on over to them. Thank you, Michael, so much for those introductions. And yeah, let's pass it over to Affinity. How are you all doing this evening? How are everyone? Thank you so much Hello. for coming. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you all so much again for, for coming out. Uh, sorry, I had to get myself off of mute. <laughs> Jessica, you want to say hey to the people? <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Yes. Um, it's always nice to see some familiar faces. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you all Yeah, for, for coming out. Um, so just to give like a little bit of uh, some background of information of, of Affinity. Um, Affinity is a Black LGBTQ plus organization uh, in Chicago, serving on the South Side of Chicago, specifically focused on uh, Black women. Um, we have, I'm sorry, y'all, uh, there is a puppy playing with me <laughs> <laughs> um, who, who, who doesn't uh, quite understand that I'm on a panel right now. So excuse that. Um, and so, yeah, Affinity has been around since uh, 1995. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary last year, um, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, for an organization uh, serving Black LGBTQ plus communities for 25 years, um, specifically Black women to be around for 25 years. So uh, it's it's an honor to be here and to be able to, to have this discussion with you all and also to be serving the community. So I want to say that um, I, I'm the older person here on this panel from Affinity. And so back in the day, uh, Affinity start was started by Black by Black women who um, who partner with women for specifically for Black lesbians and women who partner with women. And it has progressed over time um, to be a Black queer organization. And so I don't know if you understand uh, what what's the same. It's Black. It is focused on the Black perspective. It is from the Black perspective, it is for the Black perspective, and is a Black safe place for Black queer people. So now everyone knows it's Black, okay? <laughs> and and it, was, it was started because what's so amazing about it is that it was started by women who felt like there needed to be a space, specifically on the South Side, that is a safe space, and it was all volunteer. You can count on one hand the number of people that have been paid um, throughout these 25 years. And it is primarily, I, I always say it's 99.5, uh, 99% volunteer um, and 5% pay. Now those people who did get a salary, they, they were doing three jobs. So let me just say that. So I don't want anybody to say it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shout out to Irma. <laughs> <laughs> they, did, they did three jobs, Irma does three jobs. Um, it's primarily over the years, it's a volunteer organization and there have been a very few people who have drawn a salary and they've drawn a salary of one position while doing three. Thank you. Yeah. 
And um, I always say uh, Irma and Jessica can give more of the, the younger, because uh, we always make fun of uh, what were they doing uh, in, 90, in 1995. Yes, I was it's, a, <laughs> it's a it's a it's a running joke of of me saying that in 1995 I was toddling around, not knowing that I would need an organization like Affinity, uh, and so it is an honor that uh, a group of Black lesbians uh, created a, a space, uh, not fully understanding what uh, what they were working on and what they were creating. So it, it is definitely an honor to be the the five percent as ann says as a, a staff person who uh works for the organization but our values is uh it, the organization is volunteer led um a lot of the programming that we have is through volunteers and so we value shared leadership so uh one of the things that i show during our uh, volunteer training is our organizational structure, which I like to call more of like an organizational spider web. Um, and it goes in both directions. So we take leadership from, from our volunteers um, and from board uh, members and staff. So we, you know, step up, step back, and not just in conversation and in group settings, but also with the program programming that we run, a lot of it is through the volunteers. And so I'm here as a staff person to support and make sure that the community and what the community needs and wants to see actually comes to fruition. And so use, utilizing the resources that I have to make those things possible. And uh, as Jessica is here as one of our newest peer leads of Legacy, um, and that was through through uh, the minds of of community um, who Aisha, who is a, a board member, and some other people wanting to create this. But Jessica stepping up and also saying this is something that I want and I need, but came and said I would I want to be the peer lead. And so you know making sure that that's something that's happening, and I'm here to support that. So uh, that is how we run things. It's volunteers come and say, we want to see this happen. And I say, dream big. And so that's how we, that's kind of how we do our work at Affinity. Perfect example. We have someone on here, Hannah Anderson had a, a, a idea and uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I believe that it's going to turn into some programming. So, uh, and people are already ordering their costumes. That's all I'm going to say about it. But the same thing else. <laughs> But people are already ordering their costumes from a conversation, an idea, um, and now it's going to be a full blown program. So keep watching out. I'm so do we want to have a question? Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead, <laughs> Jessica. You know we talk. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. So could you? <laughs> So could you provide us with like background on Affinity and what brought it, it into being? Yeah, you know what I can, and you want to tell the story or you want me to tell the story? <laughs> yeah, you go ahead and tell the story because it is from a need. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so how Affinity came about. So in, um, in 1993, a group of black, gay and lesbians wanted to walk in the Bud Billiken Parade. And so uh, you have to uh, apply to walk in the Bud Billiken Parade. And so they submitted an application as black, gay and lesbians and the application was denied. And they submitted another one and they took out gay and lesbian and guess what, it was accepted. But they, you know, that's not where they want, that's not what they wanted. They wanted to, to really show up and be visible as black, gay and lesbians on the south side of Chicago. And so after uh, a few days working with uh, Lambda Legal and uh, the Bud Billiken Parade, they were able to walk in the parade as out black and gay lesbians. And from there, they decided we need, we need to do more. There's more work to be done um, as a community, as visibility and creating a space for us. So from there, a group of black lesbians were like, yeah, we need to do some more things. Um, this is not where we want to, to, to stop. Um, and so they created, uh, affinity in 1995. 
So yeah, that's that. That's our story in just like a little nutshell. But uh, it, like I said, it's absolutely amazing to me how like they're like, you know, what? we need more. We need visibility. People need to know that we're here. We're black. Uh, and we're on the south side of Chicago um, and creating a space for ourselves because mm -hmm. uh, as as black LGBTQ plus community, we know that there are spaces for queers in Chicago, but they're not always welcoming <laughs> to, to, you know, black queers, you know, so we needed a space for ourselves um, where we live and where we feel uh, the most like ourselves. And that's, it was on the south side of Chicago, so. Yeah. I want to say too that Chris Smith, who uh, is one of the founding members, did ask me to go to that Bud Billiken parade, and I said, <laughs> "No, thank you, no, thank you." Um, and and I think about that then how I was I did not feel like I was comfortable enough of being out like that. And now today, of course, I would walk walk in the Bud Billiken parade or any other kind of parade, but that is because I have found community and I would feel comfortable and I would feel safe because I know that my community would let anything happen to me and I wouldn't let anything happen to them. Mm -hmm. But back then I was like, no, thank you. Yeah, and it's also with like not feeling, not feeling safe at that moment. Well, there are some people who, who had that you know or like we know what we need to do it so that one day people could feel safe mm -hmm, um, exactly. so really stepping stepping out there um so that we can be able to to walk in the parade and feel comfortable or it's just to walk in society and feel a little bit more comfortable yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have another question. Um, how did you come to Affinity and what is your role today? Um, I'll go first. So back in uh, 2018, I was still living in Chicago and I was looking for community, specifically black community and specifically queer community because I never really had that. Um, I grew up playing basketball, but it was kind of like an unspoken thing. If you liked women, it wasn't like a Oh, okay, let's let's have a conversation about it. Um, so it was really the first opportunity that I had. And Anna Deshawn, who is one of the board members, was on a panel. Um, oh goodness, the name of the school is saving me. But um, so we went to this panel and I was just blown away by uh, what Affinity like had to offer. And so we ended up chatting with Anna afterwards. And then I ended up going to living room chats with Kelly Salisbury and I was sold. Um, I did move away to Virginia, but uh, the pandemic brought me back to the Midwest um, and I'm still looking for community. And I really feel like uh, when we started virtual office hours, um, it definitely like kept me sane <laughs> at the top of the pandemic. Um, so I'm just grateful for the people that I've met and uh, I just wanna continue to create that. So the idea of legacy definitely was, um, it was already there, but from the time like I returned last year, I'm like, okay, so when are we gonna start this? When are we gonna start this? When are we gonna start this? Like I made mock-ups of different um, like <laughs> logos and stuff. I <laughs> have a document of like things that I think that people would like to do. And uh, I just, I really think it's important for black women to have a space and to be able to take up space uh, and feel comfortable doing so. So that's why I became a peer lead. I came to Affinity, um, I went to a, a Black Lines meeting with Hannah Anderson. She has so much creativity and her friend, um, Otis Richardson, who now has a line of beautiful, beautiful Black greeting cards. Um, yes, they, they did a wonderful cartoon for Black Lines. It was beautiful, it was beautiful. They're both so creative. Uh, I'm not creative, I just went along, right? At the generator. And when we were there, uh, Tracy Bain was talking about Black Lines and Chris Smith stood up and she talked about Affinity in a planning meeting. And I thought, I was like, that would be really interesting because I did not know a lot of women. Um, one of my buddies is on here now and he always said I was like that woman on Seinfeld, all, all the male friends. And um, I wanted to get some female friends. I wanted to know some females. And uh, that was one of the ways that I could reach out and meet other women that I could be friends with who were um, 
who were same gender loving. And that was decades ago. That was decades ago. <laughs> Literally. Um, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I'm, I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to still be here. Um, so that, that's how I came to affinity. And, and now I am the, I am the peer lead for 40 plus, which is one of the, it is the longest running program at affinity. I, when I came to affinity, I always would make fun of people who were funny 40 plus. I was like, oh, they probably, all they doing is stepping up in there. So I have aged into 40 plus. And I have aged out of 40 plus because now I'm 54. So um, it is it is a long running program. And it has, we've seen so many transitions of, of people into the program and how they've, how they've come into it. People who have different backgrounds, um, but always from that black perspective. And so uh, I always welcome people 40 plus uh, the fourth Wednesday of the month, seven o'clock, still virtual now. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, my uh, coming to Affinity story, um, I'll try to keep it brief. And so I came to Affinity um, much like Jessica through uh, Kelly Suzanne Salisbury hosted uh, Living Room Chats at Affinity. It's every third Wednesday. And uh, I met Anna um, as well. And Anna, who's the board president, told me about Spectrum. And so then when I saw that, okay, living room chats is the same week as Spectrum, I'll go to that and see what it's like. And it was absolutely amazing um, panel. And afterwards, after every living room chats, and honestly, I think after every program uh, at Affinity, there's a group photo that's taken. <laughs> and so, uh, and it, it's, it's really great to, to see that group photo and think that's where, that's where it all started is this group photo um, because instantly you become family of like, you're in here now once you, you're in this group mm -hmm. photo. Mm -hmm. And um, actually behind me uh, is the virtual background. This is the space of Affinity. Um, and you, you see like couches and it's like so comfortable. It really does feel like a living room. And so it, after that, I was like, okay, I love this place. And then when I went to Spectrum, um, it was the first time that I felt seen as a masculine presenting uh, uh, trans non-binary person um, around black queers. It was the first time like people saw who I was and I'm also like really feminine and flamboyant and all these different things. And I never, I didn't have to fit this type of box of what masculinity looks like. And so I fell in love. And two months after my first Spectrum meeting, uh, Anna was like, anyone want to be the peer lead? And I was like, I do, I'm not doing shit else. <laughs> and <laughs> so I became, uh, I became the, the, the peer lead for Spectrum. And that was in 2019. Uh, May, May of 2019, I became the peer lead. And then in December of 2019, I became the program coordinator. Um, and just a little bit of update, because I haven't updated my bio. Um, I am now the program director of Affinity. So within Woo! the, within this, <laughs> what, what, what is this now, like two years, I, you know, it's, it's a place where I, I dived in and I was, I was, I became family and this is my community. This is my, my place, my home. And honestly, if uh, Affinity saved me because I was, I don't wanna go too far into what I was doing before, <laughs> before Affinity, but Affinity really um, not only created community for me, but uh, created a, a place where I can serve the community that I'm a part of too, which is a personal value of mine um, and also a value of community, uh, of affinity. So yeah, that's my coming to affinity story and that's where I am now. I, I, do, I am still one of the peer leads. I do have a co-lead now for Spectrum, uh, but uh, I, I still am a part of that. And uh, yeah, that's my story. <laughs> Okay, um, 
Another question, what are the most pressing issues facing the Black queer community today? And what solutions programs have you put into place to um, solve these issues? Um, I'll go first. Uh, just kind of to speak <clears throat> generally, I would definitely say resources, the lack of resources and um, connections to even know about possible resources. It's like a never ending cycle. Um, and I'll let Irma definitely speak more to like what specific programming Affinity offers, but the resources, that's, that's really what they're about. I have to agree with you, Jessica, because during this pandemic, the, uh, the amount of information that has gone out, and I'm gonna say that Irma has uh, put together and put out there and uh, has forced us on all social media mm -hmm. platforms, not just Facebook, yes. um, Instagram, and I think Twitter also, but ac across all the media platforms, Irma, who you all know now has another job, not just the promotion, but that just is an added job. Um, all the resources that were given out, especially at the beginning of the lockdown, um, we didn't know what was happening out there. We didn't know what people had access to, but Irma was always out here on these office hours and shout out to Aisha also, because Aisha was out here with the census information, with this voting information. Yeah. And we were getting information from Hana about the, uh, what, what is the CDC, CDC saying today? Uh, what is public health saying today? Irma was getting that information out there. Um, at a time that we did not really know what was gonna happen. And we were getting information regularly, at least every Tuesday and Thursday, but also on social media. Yeah, I definitely want to uh, give Irma their roses because they mm -hmm. provided a, a safe space for so many people. Um, just the thought and the care that went into the programming was definitely amazing to see. Uh, there were so many different um, special guest speakers, we did yoga, uh, we meditated, um, we talked about sex, we talked about literally everything under the sun. And um, Irma found a person, like usually a queer person that was able to relate to us. And it's just, I think that definitely personifies affinity and just that's, they're, they're thoughtful. Like as a unit, they are very thoughtful people from the board to our volunteers. Um, even uh, I like the, the newsletter, uh, they now are trying to assist uh, queer folk with getting therapy, which is amazing because a lot of us can't even afford, um, you know, basic, basic needs. And so it's just, oh, I could go on and on, but I'm gonna go ahead. <laughs> um, well, just uh, there, there are so many, there's a list of, of disparities that, that we can discuss when it comes to uh, Black LGBTQ plus communities. Um, and so just to even think about like right now with, with the pandemic and a global racial uprising, mm -hmm. um, information is, is really important so that people can make informed decisions about their lives. And so at the beginning of, uh, of the pandemic of like shutdown, we, within two weeks, moved all of our, our programming to virtual um, because it's important for us to remain connected um, as a community so that we can offer shared resources. And so with virtual office hours, which is every Tuesday and Thursday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, and and uh, just recently, and we live stream to, to Facebook and we also have uh, where we put it on the website as well. Um, just recently, we transitioned Thursday where it's not on on live, so Tuesday is still live. But this place, although I, you know, as Anne and Jessica like can can praise me of like providing resources, but it's really a community space for us to share the resources and information that we all have. And so I try to always make sure that people have space to offer the information that they have as well. Because what we know is as a community is we trust each other um, because we keep us safe. <laughs> and, and it's important that 
we share that information with each other, but to just have access to be able to do so. Um, and with uh, the, the many issues that we face of just our rights, our human, our basic human rights, our, our uh, rights to live and, and just access to affirming healthcare as, as Black queers, Black women, Black trans community. Um, again, like I said, we can go over so many different things, right? Um, That's an entire um, panel <laughs> discussion in itself. <laughs> it definitely is an entire <laughs> panel discussion to, to, to speak on all of, all of the issues that we face. Yeah. Um, but with our, with our programming, uh, virtual office hours, our peer-led groups, which we have six, um, uh, Anne is one of the peer leads for 40 plus. Uh, Jessica is the peer lead for Legacy, which is our peer led group for 40 and under. Um, again, I am one of the, the peer leads for Spectrum, which is our group for masculine presenting, masculine of center, trans men, butch, studs, non-binary. Um, and then we also have a group uh, for proud parents, which is for LGBTQ plus uh, uh, parents and those who are parenting. We have a 50 plus group and that is midstreamers. And we also have uh, trailblazers, which is our 60 plus group. And so the importance of those is the same thing. Our peer leads share information with, with their community. And so, um, so that we know what's happening, not just in Chicago or Illinois, but or in the United States, but globally. And we, we pass that information to each other so that we can be activated as activists, as community or organizers, as leaders. Um, and those, those things are important. Um, one, of the, one of the things our trailblazers started because they realized that with that, that tech gap of uh, 60 plus, which I have to commend them, they surprised me all the time. Of, of they started off with just a few of them on, on Zoom. Uh, most of them could couldn't put their turn their cameras on. I we they met last night and one person had their camera on and I was ecstatic because I hadn't seen their face since uh, since February of since February of, of, of 2020. I hadn't seen their face and I'm gonna try not to cry if you, you, you uh, I get a little emotional but I hadn't seen their face. And um, for them to be able to have their camera on really uh, got to me. And that's important. You know, I am going to cry. Um, <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. All right you don't cry because then I'm going to cry. <laughs> and um, but our trailblazers realized that there was that information gap of. And so they started a uh, calling tree where, you know, they're able to they they come together and like they call each other. And, and um, I received a text of someone saying like, my partner got a call and it made their day. But those calls not only help with isolation of it, and it, but it also provides information and resources and for us to connect with people that, you know, don't have, have internet or uh, a computer with a camera and we're able to, to see what that person needs and to be able to provide those resources, mm -hmm. uh, it, like Jessica was mentioning. So we can, we can help our community and we can get that, we can get the, you know, what they need to them. And so uh, it's important uh, to be able to, to stay connected during this time. So thank you. Good job. <laughs> I'm still fanning you with the Martin Luther King fan from church, okay? It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Yeah, I had a whole moment. I, I definitely, I sent the board a text that thank you. I was just like, yo, she's got her camera on. Every time I see someone that's got their camera on, I'm like, yo, <laughs> she's got her camera on. <laughs> that was so beautiful, Arma. Um, another question I have for you all, um, how do some spaces dismiss Black LGBTQ folk? Um, speak specifically to uh, women, I feel like we get othered kind of. Um, 
like black women are often at the forefront of liberation and radicalism and movements. And yet when it comes down to it, we don't really have anyone fighting for us. Um, and so, yeah, like inclusivity is important, but I definitely think that um, us having space where we feel empowered and we feel safe and the, to be frank, the difference between um, like solely a black community and then like mixed community is like, there are definitely things that are unspoken, like things that everyone knows <laughs> without having to say it. And so there's just this, um, this level of like sisterhood almost. And I think that's very, very, very uh, necessary. Um, I'm going to say that when, when we are as Black queers, period, outside of our community, um, if we're in the greater white supremacist, non-queer community, um, we are treated as invisible, uh, as less than. If we're in the white queer community, it's as if our needs do not matter or that we don't have a specific set of needs that are not the same needs that white queer people have. Um, and when we say that you're, you're not including us, then we're treated as if we're trampling on someone else's rights or someone else's, uh, someone else's fight as if our, what our needs are are not important. Um, and, and that for me is very disheartening. It makes me very angry. I know we, we aren't here with other people that are not necessarily in our affinity family. So I'm not going to be like, Ugh. Um, but, <laughs> but when we're in, the, when we're in our non-black queer community, we're either treated as invisible or not important or we're attacked. Mm -hmm. And that, and that's for all black queers and and when we're in the Black non-queer community, we have some of the same fight and struggles in, the, in our own community. Absolutely. Uh, just not to cut you off, Anne, but, um, you know, like when people, people have attached uh, gender roles and they mm -hmm. determine, oh, your sexual orientation based on how you look. Mm -hmm. And so, oh, I, you know, I look straight, I guess. Um, but like rejection could potentially mm -hmm. ca cause me harm. I'm also uh, heavy, I'm a fat woman. And so like, you know, like additional harm, there's definitely harm in that. Um, and there is privilege in uh, being white, there's privilege in being a man. Um, and we quite frankly don't have that. Um, so, Arma. No, I think, I think the both of you touched on um, uh, what, what, what those kind of, uh, those differences are. Um, so I'll just allow you all to. <laughs> I, I just wanted to be clear too, um, cause a part of being an affinity and being a part of affinity, um, I know that when I was in my, in my mid twenties and I wanted to live on the North side and I lived in Boys Town, and I liked going out all the time and things like that. And I was lucky enough not to uh, have uh, incidents um, that I felt like I was having an incident, but that is a white, w white male, white male gay community that is not inclusive of us, of black queers. And it wasn't then um, and it isn't now. It was not built for us, it's not maintained for us, but we're supposed to be you know, on that rainbow. We're supposed to be on that rainbow and stand with that community saying that we have to have our queer rights. Um, and while they're not standing for us saying, don't, don't kill us, you know, what about our wealth bu building? What about our protection? What about our public education? They're not standing with us on, on those issues. And so that, that's why it's important for us to have our own, our own spaces so that we can, can talk about those things safely and not be in a space that's unsafe for us. And it's also important that that's, that exists in the community um, because I, affinity wouldn't be effective, honestly, on the north side of Chicago. Uh, where it is definitely is it's a uh, 
a place of like come as you are. Um, and I definitely think that um, there, you know, we're all learning, we're all progressing and we're all um, trying to make sure that we understand people as individuals. But um, I think Affinity does a really, really good job of just providing space, a non-judgmental space for black women who are queer for sure. Thank you, Jessica and Anne. Okay, so another question. Um, could you share any differences between um, non-Black queer um, folks and Black queer women? Say it one more time, Jessica. Okay, thank I'm you. sorry about that. Could you share any differences between the non-Black LGBTQIA plus community and the Black LGBTQIA? A plus community? Well, I already said it, they're not supporting us. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they're not supporting us. We see what's happening now. Uh, it has been happening, but now it's being filmed uh, that black people are being murdered in the streets by the police. And then mm -hmm. what about black trans women who are being murdered in the mm -hmm. community and outside of the community? Where are the white gays on that? We're the white gays that are out there marching for us and for our needs. If we're supposed to be, as they say, a part of this rainbow, where are they when we're talking about wealth building? All of our communities are getting gentrified, right? All of our black communities are getting gentrified. Who's speaking up for black LGBT queer people in our communities? Who's speaking up for us? The white gays are not. They're just simply not. Yeah, and sometimes, um, you know, when you come out, you you lose your family and you have to like find your chosen family. And so sometimes that leads to a lack of education, a lack of access to jobs and um, like those things need to be provided, but that's not, let me watch my words. It's not a, um, what's what we have access to, I feel like is very different than like what a, a gay white man would have access to. I, I also think that it, um, it speaks volumes to the fact that like black queers don't, would, don't feel safe um, in, in non, like non-black queer communities. So uh, it, if, if you do a survey of like black queers of ask them where they would rather live, they're they're gonna want to live in communities, uh, black communities and communities of color, uh, versus in in white communities, um, because racism still exists. Racism in anti like anti blackness still exists in queer communities. So, I think it speaks volumes that. Uh, we would much rather live on the south side of Chicago. <laughs> and it's like, um, even white, or not even just white people, um, all people that are not black, I feel like um, there is a bit of um, racism and like certain interactions just because of uh, them not knowing any better. And there are certain things that are assumed um, that, but it's not talked about. So how can you have a conversation and no one knows that the conversation even needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like a, a vicious cycle, but we don't have to deal with that when we are dealing with uh, people like us, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. So what have been some of the tribulations of coming out um, in the community, in the black community and in the world as a whole? And do you wanna start? Well, I didn't want to just say it, but I'm gonna say from my point of view, so I don't wanna get any emails uh, but if you got to send it to me, you can send it to 40 plus at affinity95.org. Okay. Um, 
from my perspective, black people and the white baby Jesus give us all kinds of problems. And I know that in my family, I know that it's the issue. Not that anyone's going to say anything to me, but I'm sure that there's some people that have an issue when we're in our community being invisible in the greater community when we don't have this uh this normalization of black queerness when we're in our own community there can be issues for us and just like jessica said if we're coming out and we're coming out in our black community in our black families in our black households and we are kicked out we don't have the resources that maybe non-black people have if we're kicked out, we're kicked out from our family, we're kicked out from our churches, if we're ostracized in our schools, because you know in Chicago, we're in Chicago, everything is segregated. So if you live in a black neighborhood, you go into a black school. And so we ostracize in our black schools without the protections that we should be having in our schools. And so there's always a difficulty within our black community, and I say a lot of it has to do with the white baby Jesus. And I also will say as a black respectable 50 plus <laughs> woman, I will also say that it has a lot to do with respectability. And the black community does not want to see black queer people, especially when they're not following the rules of appearance and they're not following the rules of behavior. They, they don't want to see that outside of the community making us look bad, making us do stuff that's against God. I think that that's, that's, the, uh, that's one of the major problems for us in the Black community, queer, Black queers in the Black community. And that is, that is uh, in an envelope of police brutality, of not having access to quality, affordable housing quality, affordable education and health care. It's in the envelope of all of that, making it even harder. So that's yeah, why a lot of, I'm oh, sorry, Ann. Uh, okay. A lot of times when uh, people come out, they do get support, but um, often it's just like you're starting from nothing. So if you're starting from nothing, like you're, it's, it's never like the next generation builds on it and the next generation builds on it. It's always like, okay, I'm starting from here. And then it's 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 a never it's a never ending cycle really. Um, and growing up in a fairly strict Christian household, um, I never really came out. I just started showing up with women to family functions. Um, <laughs> um, but um, and my brother also um, is gay, and he definitely him and my mom had it out for a while um and it just was so steeped in christianity like this is wrong and even growing up like i struggled with uh do i like women should i like women because according to you know not necessarily the bible but being in church you know it's wrong to be gay it's a sin to be gay you'll go to hell um and that that ignorance is like weaponized almost to a point where uh, me being queer, it's like, I don't count as a woman. I can't, you know, like, oh, you can't have babies, you know, uh, being gay is ruining the, the family nucleus. Um, and just <laughs> comments like that um, mm -hmm. are, are harmful, are very harmful. Um, I would say just to, to piggyback off of uh, what Anne was saying about like respectability <clears throat> politics, respectability politics is is created to uh, keep keep the black person in line, but also like specifically the black woman. Um, there are so many limitations of and things that black women cannot do, and it is used to. Uh, weapon uh, it, it's a weapon to to invite harm to specifically black women um, of all experiences and so coming out i'm sorry uh coming out uh 
in in society is one of those things that goes against you know that respectability and whether or not um, uh, that validation of of uh, a black queer woman's uh, humanity, and so when we I also want to there's there's always this part of me that wants to like to also say that black women um, specifically have been in a community to, that has in, invited other like black queer folks into their homes so also want to say that black women keep keep us safe um, with also validating that like there's there's a lot of harm that happens um and a lot of silencing um because we know what you know whether or not your family may you know your family may be accepting your family may be like okay you can be gay just don't talk about it <laughs> don't do it out loud don't bring this person home <laughs> uh, uh and so there's a there's a lot of things it's, it's i think we immediately go to to yes there are a lot of people that are there are a lot of black queers that are uh, like homeless being displaced and that is important right because we need to those those are uh, the um, the most marginalized of our community we need to focus on those issues because housing is important uh, safe uh, housing is important for black queers and so it's important for us to, to have those discussions while also acknowledging that um, it's a it's a societal norm that like we are conditioned to think like black people are the most homophobic. <laughs> and um, I, 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 I want to um, create space and acknowledge that like they're the, the black community, like the black community is also welcoming um, as well. And so there's a there's a lot to discuss and a lot of nuance in that, but the black community is welcoming. And so I think it's an important and imperative for us to also talk about that narrative as well. Thank you so much, Irma and, and Jessica. Um, Another question, how do you find yourself challenging the norm? I will. The norm is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> the and norm is a lie. <laughs> the, the norm is exactly what, as, as Anne said, that respectability, that norm of like what you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to be in. Uh, you, you challenge that norm by living as authentic as you are, right? Living out and open. And that was the foundation of affinity, right? They wanted to walk in this parade as who they are as in, and not, not be erased and not be invisible. Mm -hmm. And that is in itself challenging what the norm is. We, we I think oftentimes, people think you have to be extraordinary and be on the front like of, of the movement and that your name is gonna go down in, in the history book of challenging the norm. You challenge the norm by existing That's as right. yourself. That's right. That is challenging the norm. That is being extraordinary. That is recreating what the norm is of, of just being your authentic self. And you know, I, that's how I move. I challenge the norm by crying on a panel. <laughs> <laughs> challenge the norm by crying on meetings with, with funders. <laughs> uh, I, I challenge the norm by being my extraordinary self of, I don't need to do anything that's quote professional. I am professional because I'm a human being and this is how I live and how I breathe and how I work. Mm -hmm. And I oftentimes just don't understand how we all agreed upon these behaviors of like, this is professional and I need to, I need to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, does that feel good to you? <laughs> like, that's always my question is like, does that feel good? Does it? And it, if it doesn't, then like, stop doing it. <laughs> do what feels good to you. 
you know? Like, do that thing is, is, that's how you challenge the norm is just being your authentic self. Um, I see that um, Princess Hannah has her name up, her hand up, I'm sorry, has her hand up. Uh, and she has a lot of ideas about the norm, I'm sure. So what did you want to say? Well, you know, as I really, you know, soaked in everything that you all are laying down, you know, it took me back in time, a time when, you know, um, you needed three or four IDs to get up into a bar on the north side. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a time when, you know, you were either lesbian, gay, bisexual, and maybe those trans over there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? A very sweet time on one respect of, you know, coming of age, being so young, because I came out when I was like 13 or 14 years old, you know, and meeting cool people along my journey, cool people like and Morgan Rowell. <laughs> Don't say my government name on here. <laughs> Don't say my government name. You know, and just being a creative person and, you know, all those things. And, and I just, as we think about the misconceptions or exploring or demystifying, you know, um, what it means to be queer in this time. Um, and a lot of people, you know, whether you're, you know, identifies LGBT or one of our straight allies that may be on here, you know, I've invited, invited uh, some to really kind of deconstruct, you know, what it is that you're talking about when you say number one queer and then all of those letters, you know, I think most people know what LGBT, you know, is, but the Q, the I, G and C, you know, P and then A, you know, and then the plus, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if, if we could kind of maybe talk about some of those things, because those, you know, honestly, growing up and coming up, you know, talking about some of the experience, my early, early experiences, I really, we didn't have that type of language. And so I know now, you know, mm -hmm. but many people still don't. So I'll just be quiet. <laughs> yes. Um, well, I'm going to say B is for bisexuals, and we are the absolute <laughs> best letter on here, because I see some bisexuals on here, and we're absolutely the best, and then Ooh, there are the, I see, you, I see you, I see you, I see you, I just call anybody, I'm only going to say I'm bisexual, but I see some other bisexuals on here, and we are the B, and we are the best letter in all those letters, but all those letters do matter. Mm. Yes. Um, so I, I guess we'll, we'll open and say a few of these letters because we are uh, an umbrella of so many identities. Um, and so, you know, the L, lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, transgender, queer and questioning, um, intersex. And then we have the A, which is agender and asexual. Um, Princess Hama said the P, which is pansexual. Um, and again, there's so many identities. Woo -woo. I see Jessica did the hands. <laughs> and there's so many different identities. And, and one of the things of, of understanding that is there are uh, sexualities, and then we also uh, have gender within this, which is separate. <laughs> but it's it's separate as far as like sexuality and gender um, and also all under this umbrella together. So understanding them um, from different perspectives, um, but all of this under together. That also is another panel, but, <laughs> but I definitely <laughs> want to We can say definitely have a, have a whole conversation um, ab about this uh, because transgender is, gender that's there yeah. and then <laughs> it's right there uh and then we have intersex which is also gender then the a which is asexual which is sexual orientation and also agender again 
gender. It kind of keep it simple, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So for for that. Uh, but that is a that is a, a whole panel and a whole conversation. So if you would like to join us in many of the programming that we have, these are conversations that we do talk about at Affinity. I, I want to say too about the norm. Um, I think the norm is created and maintained to other people. Um, and I see that there's a lot of others that are on this call. Um, and so when we're talking about the norm and how that, that uh, the, the imagery and the behavioral expectations of the norm, uh, a lot of people on this call wouldn't fit into that, you know, and it's to make us the other or the other or those others. Um, and that's why I say that the norm is a lie. The norm is a complete total lie and, and it hurts us more than, than it ever helped us. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so I have another question, and this is going to be the last question before we open it up to the audience. Um, do you have any readings or um, any recommended readings or other forms of media that you would um, recommend for those who want to learn more about like the Black queer community? Absolutely. I created um, a list of all of um, I don't know, I'm a podcast person. Um, I don't always like to read. And I also, um, I struggle with concentrating. So there are a lot of podcasts on this list. Um, so I'll also put this in the chat so you can copy and paste and uh, they're available on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Um, so first we have Queer Walk, which is the insurgent bi-weekly audio syllabus hosted by um, Money and Nikita. Um, I do wanna actually take a moment um, to acknowledge Nikita. Uh, she suddenly passed away uh, last weekend. Um, ooh, I don't wanna start crying, but um, she was amazing. Uh, she was the leader of the Black Lives Matters, uh, Syracuse um, ooh, chapter and she, uh, she she made such an impact on so many people. Uh, that's one of the ones I really would uh, recommend listening to. Also, uh, She Heard Dyke is a, po a podcast by Lex, who uh, she lives in Atlanta. She still lives in Virginia. Um, but it's a, a more lighter hearted podcast. Basically, uh, it talks about being a lesbian and also being masculine presenting. And so they interview different masculine presenting women who uh, do different things and Basically, they just want to create space. Um, Marsha's Plate is a podcast hosted by two Black trans women and a Black trans man. Um, and basically, they kind of like kiki <laughs> for an hour and a half or so. But it's you always learn something. They, they're they very genuine, and they have a lot of knowledge that they drop. Um, Boys Meet World is actually a podcast by the lovely Irma. Um, Basically, the podcast is important because it holds space for masculine presenting queer non-binary people of color who offer this world an experience of a person that cannot be defined solely by femininity or masculinity. Um, another and one check, is Hood check out that Instagram merchandise dropping tomorrow. Yes, please. Um, actually, we can put that info in the chat box as well. Um, Hood and Holistic is hosted by Ash and Court. They're a black lesbian couple, they're married. Um, I think they live in California, um, but they often discuss what it looks like just to be present with yourself as well as in your relationships. Um, they also have an online store with cool merch as well. Um, another good one is Queer and Married, which is hosted by Miller and their wife Rashida, uh, where they talk about the ins and outs of marriage and being queer. Uh, the Femcast is Janaea and Kia, and they dig deep into how they navigate queer spaces, straight spaces, and all the weird spaces in between. Um, and then we have Tea with Queen and Jay. Uh, basically, they're two nerds in the Bronx who discuss uh, liberation politics and pop culture while they drink tea. Um, and then, is it Fanti? Fanti, Ann? How do you say it? Or you're moving? Sorry, it's Fanti. 
Fanti, okay. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's fan and anti together. Fanti. Oh, okay, got it. And they're um, two, uh, two Black queer people. And then, um, again, I don't think we're much of readers, but <laughs> some great books are um, Unapologetic by Charlene Carruthers. And then a lot of books by Octavia E. Butler, but specific, specifically Parables of the Sour. Um, so I'm gonna drop this list in the chat. And then Jessica Williams, the floor is yours. Actually, there are a few questions that have popped oh, up awesome. in the chat. No worries. Um, so the first one is from um, Anna and it says here, how can the LGBTQI PGNCPA plus communities support each other and not be so divided? I guess anyone can take that question. Mm -hmm. Essentially, how does the community prevent uh, discord from within and how do they support each other and not be divided? Um, just the, off the top of my head, what I find is a lot of people uh, have a bias like already in their head like oh this is going to be this way if I go in this space I'm going to feel this way or um, instead of like doing research and asking questions and being open to learning something about someone else I really think that that's what um, is going to pull people together because we all view the world differently like no two people are the same so if we can just have more conversations instead of just making assumptions, I think that would be a good place to start. Does anybody wanna, um, anyone else on the panel wanna say anything about that, about divisions and discord within the alphabet <coughs> community? The... So I will, I will jump in real quick <clears throat> and say, I think one of the, the things similar to, to what Jessica mentioned is just, being open to uh, open to critique and uh, and and really um, because I I think when we think of uh, oftentimes when we hear this this question of of how we can be less divided. Oftentimes people are looking at the most marginalized within our community of like what they can do <laughs> to, to make those who are um, have have access to, to more privileges, um, how they, they can help them <laughs> be more comfortable. Um, and, and looking at it as like, oh, you all are what's keeping us divided. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. And so when we look at this, when we think of like, when we're looking at this question, I, I would say to challenge where your privileges are uh, within yourself, right? So where are your privileges and where are your blind spots? You have to do that work, right? I constantly, as a, as a, as a person who lives at multiple intersections uh, and identities as a black, trans masculine bi queer uh, uh, non-binary person I, I I have to acknowledge that I also grew up in a two-parent household I grew up in middle class I had access to to knowledge information resources all of my life so that provides me with certain privileges and also certain protections and so it's, it's always challenging yourself where your blind spots are and always being open to, to being called in and to critique. And I, I say this as, as if someone offers you new information and, and tells you something, to, to not view it as an attack and then view it as this person is informing me this because they care and they want me to be in their life. Um, recently, someone explained to me, and this was whatever my intentions were, if my intentions didn't come off the, the way that I 
I thought they would, that this person received it differently. And so they told me, hey, I didn't receive it. I, this is how I received it. Instead of me viewing it as an attack, I view it as this person told me these, this because they want me to remain in their life. And so when we think of like the division within our community, if you want to be of support, then be of support. Show up for those who are most marginalized within our community. That's going to, to, to lessen that divide, right? Is to, to, to show up, to speak up, to use your privileges and your voices and your voice and your body, right? <laughs> use your voice, your privileges and your body. That's what's going to, to, to lessen that divide. Thank you for that, um, that, that response, um, Irma. Zakia uh, asked a question um, saying, I'm really curious if anyone on the panel or here has any recommended reading or material on the history or present day representation of the femme black lesbian. I don't come across a lot of material that elevates femme lesbian and that history or that continuation. Anyone can can grab that question, should they? Who asked that question? Zakia. Zakia, when you find that book, can you please email me? Because I have not, I have not seen it. And uh, as much as I, I consider myself a film, uh, same gender loving this woman, uh, so I really am not trying to read about people like me, but. I really haven't seen the books out there about that experience. And I, I know that they're out there, yeah. but I haven't seen the uh, the books of those experiences, and especially from a black perspective. Honestly, I agree with Anne. Um, but again, Irma being the amazing human that they are, had crew, I don't remember uh, her last name on virtual office hours, and she actually um, is one of the founders of Black Lesbian Archives. Um, so I'm going to drop their Instagram in the chat. Um, but yeah, she's basically working on the history of being a lesbian really in America, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so she travels around and she gets different information um, and she's collecting it. It's an amazing, feet really that she's taking on but I would definitely say um follow her and then her I'm sorry follow Black Lesbian Archives and then in the um bio area you'll see her um uh, Instagram name where you can go to her page as well yes thank you Jessica for that um yes Black Lesbian Archives is a is a great resource um for a, a lot of information and like Jessica mentioned is doing amazing things, is going to keep doing amazing things. Um, so that's a great place to, I would suggest to start um, uh, for looking for additional uh, information into to black queer community. And it's a grassroots. So it's from us, it's from us by us type of situation. Okay, there's another question about how do I approach healing and groundedness and identifying as queer much later in life due to family shaming. I repress the idea or notion entirely and exploring that when I want to be responsible evening questioning. So how do I approach healing and groundedness and identifying as queer much later in life? Having to, you know, and the question, yeah. Well, I would say I learned a lot about myself when I started being really honest with myself um, and just kind of having those hard conversations with myself. Um, I journal and like even the things that I'm ashamed of, like I will write it out and just try to put it somewhere and then that way I can go back to it and look at it. And then I would say definitely try to find a therapist. Um, man, because <laughs> it definitely helps. Um, someone who absolutely is queer affirming. Um, 
I would definitely say if, I don't know, I forgot who asked the question, I'm sorry, but um, I would definitely say if- Catherine asked the question. I would, if, if you're a person of color, definitely get um, a, a therapist who can relate to you without having to um, state the obvious. You don't have to over explain things. There are certain things that are just understood um, and I definitely think like with time and just honesty and hard work, it, it's possible to come to terms with that. You also have us if we, you know, want to hang out with some queer folk. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I and I think when you say, late, you know, when you have allowed yourself to be yourself, um, and that, that doesn't mean that you're out to family and at work and everybody like that, but just to yourself, allow yourself that grace allow yourself to be able to um, make sure that you're always centering your own identity before anybody else's comfort. And so I'm from the school of, I'd rather the whole room be uncomfortable than me be uncomfortable. And so you have to make sure that you're creating space for yourself, for you to express who you are and who you want to be with because People getting vaccinated and the outside is opening up and it's about to get warm and you want to make sure that you are centered in a place that uh, you're allowing yourself to have these relationships with people. And I'm not talking about, you know, get you a partner. I'm just talking about um, having relationships with other queer people yeah. and allowing yourself to be your, your queer self. And don't beat yourself up if you're saying that I am... I'm having the realization of uh, being a queer person later in life. As long as you're still alive, it's not too late. Amen. It's not too late. <laughs> not to, uh, and I say too, we have come through a worldwide pandemic and just being able to be here on this screen mm -hmm. means that you winning already. You mm -hmm. winning already. So look back. It's a lot of people that are not here with us would love to have their life back. And so now is the time to get out there, get your vaccine, if, if that's what you wanna do, but keep yourself safe and, and just be centered in who you are and be yourself and know that it's okay. And if, if you start doubting yourself, come on office hours, right. okay? Tuesday and Thursday, 10 to, well, it's supposed, it's supposed to be 11 to one o'clock, but we, sometimes we go a little bit longer. Um, <laughs> But you can come out here and there are people who are going to invite you in. And so you can start learning how to be around other queer people and you just be your queer self. Yeah, and you and deserve I, to be loved. That's right. Uh, exactly how you are, be exactly who you are, whether that's by a partner, whether that's by friends, whether that's by family. And even if you have to find your chosen family, like you deserve that. Um, mm -hmm. I think you you know you owe that to yourself. You owe that genuine happiness to yourself for sure. Yeah. Just to piggyback off of both of those. <laughs> amazing. Uh I, I would say come come to affinity. Come to affinity. Um, you know, it it you can be your authentic self. Um and however that shows up for you. Um and we acknowledge that who you are, we validate that. Um, and, you know, whatever place that you are in coming to realization of your sexuality, your identity, we honor all of those stages. And so um, we, like I said, we have a lot of groups. You find the one that's for you uh, or the ones can be multiple because um, uh, I've attended all of them except for proud parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh you can, yeah, we have so many different ways to, to be a part, as they've mentioned, uh, virtual office hours, which is from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. We have a book club. Yes, and mentioned we have a book club that is actually tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, so a lot of different ways to, to find community, to, to access community of, of people who, who look like you, who are like you, who've been where you've been um because there is a point where whether it is early in you know quote early in life or late in life which is mm -hmm. in all different stages of life we've all had these moments of questioning um i recently just watched a, a movie 
that that said that that is the one thing that we've all we all have in common um is 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 that like that moment and um we can we can all we you know if you have questions we can speak to that and um and even if you don't want to ask the questions you can just exist and be a part of it be a part of the journey but community is a is a great way to to really um uh find yourself or center yourself as i've mentioned before i when i found spectrum and although i was already i you know was already out <laughs> Uh, but when I found Spectrum, I was able to exist among community that, you know, I, I felt validated and I felt safe. And so finding that community that made me feel safe made me make also like allows me to feel safe in other places because I had that community and I had that, that chosen family, those people who if I have a question and still, and, and as a staff person, as a person who is, you know, a quote leader in community and all these things, I'm still moving with, within this, right? So I still, I still have questions and I still am learning and community offers that and when I don't know. And there are times I don't know. So, yeah. And welcome to the Queer Club. Yeah, welcome. It can Come be on. a good time. It can be a real good time. Well, it is a good time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it is a good time. <laughs> I have a well, question. Not, I'm, I'm, have sorry. A, I'm sorry. I have a question for you. And how do you stay funded? And um, so that's one. And how do we contact you to donate or to volunteer? You know what, Jessica's coming with, I see, I see you coming with the, with the links. I, had, um, I forgot to drop it earlier, sorry. <laughs> it's coming with the links. See, I always talk about communities coming through. Uh, I cannot do the work that I do without, uh, without my people. Uh, with virtual office hours, Anne is always grabbing those comments from Facebook because I be missing them sometimes. So as our community, but you know, we get we get funded through grants, uh, uh, as, you know, as well, but also through the supportive community. Um, and thank you, thank you, Jessica, for dropping that in there. Uh, so uh, I I am always like honored that you know um, that funds see the um, see the, the 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 need in an organization like Affinity. So, um, yeah, and also just uh, our community, our, our giving circle of, of people within our community, uh, our allies, our co-conspirators in this movement uh, who, who want to be a part of sustaining um, our organization. Uh, I wouldn't it's, be a fundraiser if I didn't say, um, you can give you know, a dollar a month, five dollars a month, and just put it on a reoccurring um, system. I know I, I have it, it comes out every month off my credit card. And um, I don't miss it, but I definitely, every time I get on office hours or every time um, I get a text message, I, I missed um, a walk-in club and Oka's like, hey, are you okay? It's just, um, Oka's so sweet. yeah, like the, the <laughs> genuineness, like you, you can't put a price on it for sure, but you definitely can try. So <laughs> if you have it, you know, definitely please feel free to give it the link. So I'm old school, I write checks, paper checks. I like to know where my money's going. I got to have that paper check. But there was a time where I didn't have the money to necessarily um, make the donations like that when I was at Affinity. I always made sure that I gave my time. I used to make pound cakes, but I can't have the oven on because I'm hot all the time. But now <laughs> I have the ability um, to make a donation and give a little bit more for someone who can't because at one time I couldn't. And someone gave and made sure that there was a space. So I always say, if, you, if you're unable to give, we still want you to come. We still want you to participate. If you mm -hmm. are able to give, please give. And if you're able to give a little more for someone who can't, 
please make sure you give a little more. But no, yeah. no donation is too small and none is too big. We'll take them all. Yeah. And I as have, our as our uh, our uh, board vice president has said, if you you know, it donate if you want to donate your time, talent, and treasure, we accept it all, uh, and um, we honor it all. <laughs> yes, Aisha. Yes, uh, we honor it all. Um, if you, if it's your time, that is a part of sustaining this beautiful organization. And I always honor the, the many volunteers that help sustain me because <laughs> I do not do this alone. I may, I may be the, the, you go to the website, I might be the only one under the staff that box, but you'll also see many other faces of our board and of our, uh, of our peer leads, but there's also so many people that support um, because and, and, and they give of their, their, their talents and of their, their time. And that's absolutely beautiful. And again, I honor that because there's only, you, when, you're, when you're one person, you, there's, and there's so many things to do. Um, community is, is really what you need. Um, it's really the, the, the tool to liberation is people um uh and you can see that with uh with fred hampton uh is people if you you know that's that's how we that's how we get there that's how we cross that line enjoyed this so much thank you so much for taking your time to be here with us um first i want to thank jessica for putting this all together this was all because of her <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. And then for spending your precious time with us, Irma, Jessica Switzer, and Anne. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, and we will definitely be sharing your um, donation link with on our Twitter and on, in, on Instagram, link tree, whatever we can to get the word out because I appreciate you and this, I, I wondered so much. I remember last year when we went into quarantine and in last March, for me, it hit me. I wonder how the, the organizations in Chicago are able to help their communities. That was what I was most worried about. So when Jessica organized this event, you know, and you've talked about how you have reached out to your community um, all the different communities that are in need. Um, it's, it, it, it makes me feel good that, you know, that there are um, people who are out there doing that work. Um.